Hello, uh, my name is Brian Liddy and welcome to The Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland um, on Sunday the 26th of June 2022. Um, thank you for joining us if you're at home. Um, today um, we have, um, I'm pleased to say, a guest. Uh, uh, we've got Eleanor with him um, joining us via the internet. Um, Eleanor, um, you're the SNP MSP for Carrick. Cumnock and Doon Valley, um, but you're also um, the convener for the social uh, for social justice on the the social justice committee in Holyrood. Um, so um, I'm sure we'll be um, using your special insights later in the show for some of the topics that we've got lined up. But um, so um, thank you for joining us. And uh, but before we get into the stories, um, I've got the latest Ukraine update, um, which is um, day 123 of the conflict in the Ukraine. Um, so, uh, Russian forces are trying to cut off the strategic twin city of Lysychansk in eastern Ukraine, having reduced severe Donetsk to rubble. Uh, Lysychansk is set to become the, the next main focus of fighting as Moscow has launched massive artillery bombardments and airstrikes on areas far from the heart of east, the eastern battles. Ukraine called its retreat from Severodonetsk a tactical withdrawal to fight from higher ground in Lysychansk on the opposite bank of the Siveresky Donetsk River. Russia will send missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads to Belarus in the next few months, Russia's President Vladimir Putin said on Saturday while hosting the Belarusian leader Alexander, Alexander Lukashenko. In the coming months, we will transfer Belarus. Iskander M tactical missile systems, which can use ballistic or cruise missiles in their conventional and nuclear versions, Putin said. The mayors of several European capitals have been duped into holding video calls with a deep fake of their counterpart in Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko. Um, the mayor of Berlin, Franziska Giffey, took part in a scheduled call on the WebEx video conferencing platform on Friday with a person she said looked and sounded like um, Klitschko. There were no signs that the video conference wasn't being held with a real person, her office said in a statement. Ukrainian shelling on Saturday forced Russian troops to suspend the evacuation of people from a chemical plant in Sevier Donetsk just hours after Moscow's forces took the city, according to the TASS news agency. Separately, a senior advisor to the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, said special forces were still in Sevier Donetsk directing artillery fire against the Russians. Boris Johnson urged G7 leaders not to give up on Ukraine as he pledged additional financial support for the Ukraine um, for Ukraine as it attempts to fight the Russian invasion. Ukraine can win and it will win, but they need our backing to do so. Now is not the time to give up on Ukraine, Johnson said on Saturday. A statement from Downing Street said the UK stands ready to provide another $525 million in loan guarantees. Uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Saturday that the Ukraine will win back all the cities it has lost to Russia, including Sevier Donetsk. All our cities, Sevier Donetsk, Donetsk and Luhansk, will get them all back, he said in a late night video address. Zelensky also admitted that the war was becoming difficult to emotionally handle. Um, the US has announced that it will provide 18 patrol boats to Ukraine as part of the 13th security package promised on Thursday. Included in the package announced are two 35-foot small unit riverine craft, six 40-foot maritime combat craft and ten 34-foot Dauntless Sea Arc patrol boats, the US Department said on Thursday. So um, that's... Uh, the latest um, update from the Ukraine, um, Elena. Uh, was there anything in today's update that you'd like to comment on? Anything that caught your eye? Thanks very much um, for that update, Brian. And I think from my perspective on it, um, 
I'm concerned that we're seeing some um, calls from some leaders that, um, you know, seek for, for Ukraine to perhaps concede some of the territories to bring the war to an end. I think this will dominate um, the, the G7 discussions um, at the moment. I think that we need to hope that, um, you know, countries will come together to continue to support the efforts. Um, I'm a wee bit concerned that we seem to be losing some of the coverage um, on the news with, you know, with regards to what's happening on the ground for, for people in Ukraine, we don't seem to have the same um, level um, of understanding that there's still a lot of people trapped there. Um, there are still people who are, are facing unimaginable horrors who have been underground for a long time, or as you mentioned in um, the chemical plant um, and are needing that safe passage out. And I think something that we're seeing um, affecting everybody across the globe at the moment um, as uh, the fact that you know you have a huge amount of grains that are um, that we we rely on Ukraine for for food um, security across the across the planet. Um, Sky News did a really fantastic piece of, of um, forensic scrutiny looking at a, a ship that they um, are saying you know, was laden with grain and actually moved um, by Russia um, to Turkey. So things like that happening in the background have a huge knock on effect. Um, globally for everybody. So I think we need to remember there's people still on the ground um, suffering immensely in, in Ukraine. Um, so we can't let it slip out of the news. Yeah, and I, I think for me, also, I, just to echo your um, your, your, your points, um, I, I thought it was interesting that President Zelensky mentioned the fact that it was becoming emotionally um, difficult, which is understandable, absolutely understandable. Um, yes, I think, I, I think you'd probably agree that when we do hear about the Ukraine, certainly from Westminster, then it seems to be more used as a political um, football rather than um, being sincerely about what's actually going on there. But, but we'd better move on to the next story, um, which is checks notes. Sorry. Just before we go on to that, Brian, if I can just make a comment about the political football element of it. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, Zelensky is going to use every tactic that he has available to him as a leader. And if that includes welcoming Boris Johnson there to get things, you know, on a, a you know, a global um, platform again, I can understand why he does it. But the cynic in me absolutely sees that, that you know, Johnson's using um, his, his forays over there for an entirely different purpose. Um, and I think that's, you know, to give him some some positive press. Um, that's not taken away from the UK, um, I think, agreeing to support the Ukraine in any way that it can, whether whether that's loans or whether that was, was arms before. Um, but yeah, the cynic in me sees um, explicitly what's happening in terms of the, of the media coverage for that. Yes, and speaking of um, Boris Johnson, um, he is um, basically the next topic. Uh, so uh, after the defeats at the Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton by-elections, um, will Boris Johnson survive and can the Tories win a general election in England with or without him? Um, what do you think? I think if we if we think as well about the chair of the party, Oliver Dowden, stepping down um, on Friday, I think that was um, that blindsided Johnston, according to um, some reports. I think he wasn't expecting that to happen at all. Once you've lost the confidence of your party chair, um, I think it's very difficult for you to come back from that. We know that there's some MPs that are being reported to make moves against him. They're talking to opposition parties about whether they're going to perhaps walk the floor to um, to join um, another party because they just have no confidence in their leader anymore. Um, and I think that you know he's on a very sugarly peg. Um, if we if we look at what voters did in Wakefield and um, in um, Tiverton and Honiton, you know they tactically voted um, Lib Dem. You know Labour voters absolutely said on on Vox Pops that they they switched their vote um, to to vote for the party that they knew would remove um, the Conservative um, out the running. Um, and if we look at Wakefield, that's a, the red wall starting to to you know to change again. And I think that that will happen in any other by election that we see. Um, and I know you know Boris Johnson said this is kind of mid term um, usual stuff that happens that you know people in by elections um, decide to vote against the government that's in situ. But when you have the leader of the the Scottish um, Conservatives vocally saying again, um, again, my cynic, the cynic in me is going to say that he changes his mind on that um, on an almost daily basis. But you know, there's there's no um, appetite for Boris Johnson to con you know to continue in the role from within his own party. So 
whether they change the rules, that's what they're talking about now, you know, the 1922 committee, whether they can, because, you know, there's letters of, of no confidence already going back in and, you know, you're supposed to wait a year, whether they'll change the rules um, to, to, you know, remove him before that, I, I'm not so sure. But the Conservative Party tends to get rid of, of leaders um, when they know that they're really damaging them in the polls. So yeah, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah, I, I think they'll, they'll, there's a good chance that they'll change the rules in the 1922 committee so that they can hold another vote of confidence or no confidence um, before a, a year has passed. And yeah, I, I think they want them out. And, um, and as for the tactical voting, it, it was spectacular. I mean, it's almost as if they'd actually decided beforehand, everybody, all the voters had spoken to each other and said, OK, you vote that way and I'll vote this way. It was incredible. And then just to bring it into a, a Scottish perspective, um, the First Minister um, was quoted as saying that the by-election results were, were a monumental, massive, humiliating vote of no confidence in Boris Johnson. And she also went on to say that if they keep him um, a law-breaking prime minister who has been seen to not tell the truth, if they keep him in office, they effectively are all complicit in this. Um, and um, just one more, quick, I'll try and be quick, but I thought it was really interesting then that in the Express newspaper, they said, Miss Sturgeon's criticism was quickly quashed by the Scottish Labour leader who suggested the First Minister should address her own concerns of support before boasting of conservative dismay. So basically, there. I think, do, do we have the leader of the Scottish Labour Party giving words of support to the Conservative Party? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very strange assertion. I mean, I think, you know, Anna Sarwar will, will come out um, fighting in any way that he thinks he can try and land a punch on on the First Minister and, and the party of government. Um, but, you know, he should actually be completely agreeing with the First Minister here and, you know, for, for him to, to say anything otherwise and try and, you know, bring other news into into the mix is, you know, to me, that's just um, poor politics. Um, and I do think that, you know, nothing can embarrass Boris Johnson. That's, that's what underpins all of this. He just is able to kind of roll with the, you know, the punches and everything that happens and, and somehow always come out on top. I think that is rapidly crumbling at the moment. You know, people do not have any confidence in him. And you're right, it really did feel as if all of those switching voters, um, especially down south that voted Lib Dem, it is as if they all had a conversation with each other. Um, but that is the national conversation. And I think that that is how people are actually operating at the moment. I think if you... Um, gave people the chance to, 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 you know, put their own vote about Boris Johnson, I think that we would see um, uh, that the party voted out at this time. And I think that they understand that. I'm not so sure that they think that they would do well if there was a snap um, general election. But, you know, all the other parties are getting ready for that to be called because this position isn't sustainable any longer. Yeah, um, Sarwar, there's quite a long piece on the LBC website um, with an interview that Sarwar gave them um, in relation to the, the by-election results and I'll just again quickly maybe quote a little piece from that where he said the results showed that the UK wanted um, to um, boot the Tories out um, of the UK which means Labour could win again which means the SNP are on a sugly peg in Scotland. Um, is, he, is he right? Um, are the SNP's coat pegs sugarly and uh, do the by-election results in England mean the SNP are going to lose here in Scotland? I don't think that's the case because I think people actually um, have woken up to the fact that it doesn't matter how the rest of the UK votes. Scotland is always going to be beholden to that result. Um, so to, to you know to, to say that our pegs are sugary to me um, is just trying to capitalise on on what happened down south. I do think we can look to the the local government elections and we we, we can see um, that uh, any inroads that um, the Conservatives had made um, in you know the last and in, in twenty seventeen were very well you know eroded this time. And Labour did have some gains. We we can't um, shy away from that fact. Um, and yeah, but I don't think that will translate into a national level at the moment because um, Scotland's politics, as always at the moment, are un, you know through that polarised lens in the constitution. And I think until we have that issue settled, um, people are, are going to vote along those lines. Yeah, and if if we had more time, it would it would have been good to go into um, what um, the leaders of the 
Scottish Lib Dems had to say about it as well and the other parties. But sadly, um, I think we have to move on. So the next story is um, strikes and the cost of living crisis. Um, so as strikes are set to increase over the cost of living rising, should we be more worried over inflation or starvation spiralling out of control? Well, my perspective from a social justice perspective and sitting on, you know, the social justice committee as convener um, and and hearing the, you know, the, the evidence we've been taking in our inquiry that we're just concluding on low income and problem debt, it's harrowing what we're hearing. You know, we are hearing that people, you know, are having to not choose between heating and eating anymore. I think, we, you know, we're beyond that point. And I think that people's fears are are huge and they're already starting to 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 pull back on their you know their spending if they're if they're you know have any extra money but if they're really on those margins um that's a really difficult thing and i think that you know people do have concerns about wage price you know wage versus and um, price rises and whether that will you know end up with spiraling um inflation um and you know that's an academic thought. I, I think sometimes that doesn't really play out in the reality of, of what happens on the ground. Um, I would always support anybody's right to strike um, for, for equal you know, pay, for improved conditions, for um, you know, wage increases where they see that, that they're needed. And we have had an erosion of wages um, since the, the financial crash of 2008. There's no doubt about it. Wages have stayed stagnant in the private sector. Um, and you know, we're seeing anger and that happened um, anytime you have financial pressures where people really see the cost of living get to a stage where they're really concerned that their income cannot match the level of that inflation. Um, I hope we don't get into a stage where we did in the, you know, 1975, where you had 25% inflation and any increase in, in wages that went up were just gobbled up and we ended up in that kind of horrible situation. Um, I do hope that the three billion pounds package that the Scottish government um, has, you know, deployed over this financial year that would help in all sorts of ways, whether that's the Scottish child payment, whether that's, you know, continuing the mitigation of the bedroom tax, looking at, um, you know, mitigating the benefits cap, etc. These are all positive moves. Um, and I do think that we have to realise that this public sector pay issue um, is going to be difficult, especially in Scotland. We have that finite budget. We don't have all the macroeconomic levers that mean that we would be able to, to, you know, to borrow as other countries would do to, to fix this issue. We're tied really heavily to what the UK government um, does in that respect. And equally councils um, in, in Scotland as well, you know, may have reserves they can draw on, but you can only spend reserves once. Um, and using reserves to, you know, to, to deal with pay is, is not a way to, to go. So I think we are going to head into, um, you know, further strife for four strikes you know it was yeah. two pound to fill up two pound a litre to fill up our car yesterday um and you know that that really starts to feel scary yeah it's not um, easy um, and elena you talked about the the reality on the ground and 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 support for the right to strike um uh, just to uh show you um the reality on the ground and um, we, um, we sent um we, we went out to have a look at the picket line outside central station yesterday we've actually got two videos today for you um, um viewers uh, and i think they're both connected but here's the first one of those from um, central station yesterday Johnson will, of course, would find an argument for what uh, for what he stands for. This would have been prevented if uh, there was a better pay for the workers, um, and of course, taxpayers are also they would be satisfied if there were a better pay for workers, um, and um, all of this would have been just avoided. But. Uh, as trade unionists, uh, we need to fight back um, when uh, there is um, attack on workers' rights, um, on attacks on uh, pay, um, and that's why we're here to show solidarity. All we've heard all week from crack shots and fellas. I think it's important that uh, members of parliament uh, support our constituents and some of the bigots are uh, Glasgow South West constituents. I'm here to offer my full solidarity and support to them. Well, there's absolutely no doubt 
that when you've got Grant Sharps in the chamber saying that uh, slagging off the trade union movement, but then turning around when he's asked what he's doing to resolve the dispute to say it's not his job. Well, it is his job. He's the Secretary of State for Transport. It's exactly his job. He could have got everybody around the table to try and settle this dispute and try and talk about the issues, but he's refused to do it. They have uh, completely abrogated their uh, responsibilities and they've ramped up uh, by backing the employers with their anti-trade union rhetoric. They really are a disgrace. What's added to that and what, what will not provide a good service is some of the cost-cutting and uh, cutting corners which Network Rail want to do with safety. Uh, the RMT union are rightly making the point that it's not just about the safety of uh, them as a workforce, but the safety of passengers and the general public. So there you go, Elena. Um, solidarity, um, we saw it there um, when the fire brigade drove past. Um, with um, They did that twice, by the way. Um, and, so the, and they were actually on their way to join Pride, which is why they had the rainbow flag yeah. on the side. And that's what I think is a connection. We can talk about it a bit more later because we'll be have, um, talking about Pride at the end of the show. But... Um, well, yeah, I, mean, I might as well say it now. It's like, um, what what I saw was that there was um, uh, you had the fire brigade on their way to Pride, stopping off twice um, to show their solidarity with um, what's happening in the the, the railways, um, and then later during the march, and you'll see this, I think, in the video footage. There were um, it was very political. It wasn't very corporate as it has been in previous years, um, and there were lots of placards supporting. The strike actions um, and lots of chants as well, um, but um, I suppose maybe I'm getting ahead of, ahead of myself. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say about about either the cost of living crisis or the strikes? We haven't really said much about the strikes yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know people across the, the public sector and indeed also in, in the private sector, where people really have struggled with with wages that have not increased for for a very long time, are going to come out in solidarity with each other. And I think it's only right that they do that. And you know, trade unionism is fundamentally a, a part of of you know the, of the fabric of our society. Um, and I think that so, solidarity is going to happen because um, you know you can't have you know solidarity for your own workforce and not recognize other workforces are feeling the same issues um I, and I think that's fantastic considering that the mainstream news tend to have a different view and we, we've seen that kind of play out and there is some you know a, a narrative that's that's happening at the moment where we wonder is that because a lot of journalists um, are not from the working class backgrounds don't have an actual understanding of the struggles that that people face um and you know I, I think that that's another probably another whole show that you could have round about that and um, but i think you are going to see this issue cross different sectors so to me it was it was right that that actually ended up going into pride and pride was quite political yesterday um, and i think that that you know took pride back to that that kind of political um beginnings that it had um and you know i think we're, we're set to see more strikes um and um, you know, what the outcome of that is going to be, I'm not so sure at the moment. But when people that are working are having to go to food banks, when people are not able to actually earn a wage that will pay them enough to support themselves and any family that they have, um, that's, that can't continue. That's not sustainable. Uh, yeah, and um, again, we're, we're short on time, but there's so many things that I think that are interconnected um, with what's going on in the strikes at the moment. For example, I've, I noted that um, the the United Kingdom um, have just um, struck a trade deal uh, with, because um, I haven't mentioned Brexit yet, so um, the, the United Kingdom struck a trade deal with um, Gulf states that is going to leave out human rights and the rule of law. Um, and again, that just seems to be, it's just another attack on, you know, you talked about the right to strike. And it's, it's, it seems to me that it's almost as if um, Human rights are optional. I don't. I don't know. Well, I, I would agree with that, and I think that you know you're seeing a, a Conservative Party in, in, in the United Kingdom Parliament decide what rights they want to support and what rights they want to, to you know to remove from us. 
And if you think about the right to protest, um, if you think about even gypsy travellers having the right to be able to go about their life as they want to do it, you know, um, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, the police, policing bill, the, you know, the borders bill, etc. Now the, the seeking to remove, um, you know, our, our human rights that we have enshrined in, in European um, law, these to me are, are very scary and it's a slippery slope. Um, and I don't think that Mary Black, when she gave that speech about fascism in, in, in Westminster, was far off the mark. These are the kind of indicators when, you're, when your rights like that are being eroded um, and all of a sudden you, you don't recognise them until they start coming for you. Um, and I think that people across the country are starting to wake up and, and there's solidarity being shown um, you know, across all different quarters now with a collective aim, I think, of, of removing um, this corrupt and, and horrible UK Tory government. Yeah, I, I, I agree that, that um, Mary's, Mary Black's speech um, in Westminster, which if people haven't seen it, because it you're right, it wasn't giving much coverage, they really should check it out on, um, on the, the internet. It is there. Um, and she said that fascism, it doesn't come in you know, with um, Jack boots. uniforms and marching boots and loud music. It comes in quietly and slowly and surreptitiously over time and then before you know it, it's too late. Um, so yeah, people definitely should take a look at that uh, if they haven't seen it before. But the next story that, that we have um, is uh, Roe versus Wade. So um, as uh, the, the American uh, Supreme uh, Council overturns Roe versus Wade, Nicholas Sturgeon will be hosting a summit on abortion rights in Scotland on Monday. Um, I know that you'll know more about that than, than I will, um, Elena, but um, checks notes again. Uh, yeah, maybe we should I mean, just start by saying something about what's coming up. This is a subject that I could probably talk for an hour on itself. Um, just recently, I, I participated in a members debate in the parliament roundabout um, you know, buffer zones outside um, clinics that offer, offer, you know, abortion in Scotland because any women, any, you know, anyone that's going to actually access that, that healthcare should not have to run the, the you know, the, the gauntlet of, of people who are, are there protesting. And, you know, I don't subscribe to the, the view that they're vigils. Um, I subscribe to the view um, that they're harassing um, and that they're scary. Um, as a women's aid worker, years ago, I took a woman um, to access such a service um, and we had much smaller protests there, but even somebody standing with a placard um, silently or, or murmuring a prayer is enough, um, in my opinion, um, to be, you know, to constitute harassment um, of women here. So I'm glad that the First Minister is having the summit tomorrow. Um, with regards to the news out of the United States, um, I, I went from being weepy to being incandescent with rage. Growing up in Canada, um, you know, that's just very close neighbours to the United States, hyper aware my entire um, adolescence and, and early adulthood um, about that real anti-abortion message that was starting to creep over into Canada. Um, and I remember standing on the, the steps outside Notre Dame Basilica where there was a, a anti-abortion group um, visiting um, and doing big prayers within the basilica, chanting, you know, at the age of 15, get your rosaries off my ovaries. Um, and to me, this just felt as if we've rolled back women's rights massively. And this is going to impact on, you know, so many women in the United States, but that creeping effect that that money has, you know, that far right Christian fundamentalist monies that we know funds a lot of this stuff, that's already here in Scotland and we can't ignore that fact. It's, you know, it's kind of links back to that fascism argument that we were just talking about, the erosion of people's rights. And I'm really concerned about women in the United States. I'm concerned about women of colour in the United States, women who are very poor in the United States, because if you have money, you're going to be able to travel to access that health care. If you don't, you're going to have to make other choices. And, you know, there's no such thing as outlawing abortion. There's such, you know, there's outlawing safe abortion because abortions will happen regardless of, you know, of this ruling. So that is what has me absolutely worried. And I was really glad to see the, the announcement by the governor of California who signed, um, you know, laws that make it a safe haven for, for women to travel and um, to seek such health care. And they're not going to cooperate um, with the, 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 you know, insidious 
um, sharing of information um, that underpins a lot of this. Women are, are you know, deleting their period tracking apps in the States because this is going to be, you know, part of this whole thing. If they think you're pregnant and you've traveled out of state and you come back and you're not pregnant, you know, are you going to be charged? And we've already seen women charged in the States for having miscarriages. Yeah. I... That's, that's just absolutely horrifying to me. Um, yeah. You're right, Iskari, that there are two um, previous uh, programs that we put out here from um, Broadcasting Scotland. One was a... F um, well, just the other day, um, Andrew Wilson's fr Friday night um, school um, Scotland at seven. Um, Andrew Wilson um, made some really good points. Um, but um, what I would really recommend people do is um, go back a bit further to. Um, I've got the date here. Um, the full Scottish with Maggie Lennon and Bonnie Greer on the fifth of September, twenty twenty one. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to, to direct people to check both of those programmes out. But um, going back to what we were talking about today, and you are saying the First Minister, I mean, she sent a tweet out saying that it was one of the darkest days of for women's rights in, in her lifetime. And, um, and of course, she recently attended um, a women's rights um, conference with other world leaders, few women world leaders in Italy. Um, and she's also been on record in the past saying that people that protesters who want to um, protest ag against abortion, they shouldn't do so directly outside of facilities pr pr um, providing those um, services. They should um, uh, do those protests outside the places where people make policies and and, lo and laws, i.e. Holyrood. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I don't, I'm talking too much. Um, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if, if people wanted to come and protest outside Holyrood every single day against abortion, that would be absolutely fine. The place not to do it is where people are trying to access their, their rights to health care. Marie Todd, um, you know, Minister, also was quite vocal in saying that, you know, abortion care has been legal in Scotland for over 50 years and it will continue to be legal in Scotland and we will not be seeking, you know, any reduction in any time limits or anything like that. And I think these are our messages that, you know, we need to make crystal clear. You know, whatever somebody's personal beliefs are, that's their personal belief. But when that starts to impact on rights that women already have, um, that's just not right and it's not going to happen in Scotland and certainly um, I think around the world it's been a, a wake-up call um, for you know for women everywhere um, that you know that have access um, to to abortions um, and that you know want to continue to be able to do that that's bodily autonomy nobody has the right to tell me what to do with my body or any other women um, and I, I find it fundamentally wrong um, that someone should seek to have that control over a woman but then really does not care if you look at the policies that are in place in the united states about those children once they're here and um, there is no social safety net and um, to me they're, they're, it doesn't demonstrate that they really value these children um, and the level of control that they're um, now using on on women everywhere should send a chill down everybody's spine yeah and uh, you just said basically exactly what um, Bonnie Greer said when she was um, on the show with Maggie Lennon, um, Bonnie made the, um, the connection that um, actually Roe Ro versus Wade was a test case for um, changes that were made to the American Constitution that gave um, black people the right to vote um, about 100 years ago. And um, so there's a, a direct. It's what you said about it's it's your body. And uh, the when when black people were were given the vote in America. The, the argument was that um, that uh, I've, I've again checked notes. Uh, oh, here it is. Um, it was a test case to find out if abortion was constitutional, um, and the uh, the anti-slavery amendments that allowed black people to vote. Was, the idea of that was that um, their body belong. My body belongs to me and cannot be enslaved by anybody. So that was to do with voting, but then it was tested yeah. in terms of abortion. So that, I think that's interesting. Yeah. And Absolutely, then, and I think that you know, if you think about you know, black people being given the right to vote back then, and um, that was fraught with difficulty as well because we ended up, you know, there's a lot of academic research that's been done that shows you ended up with a huge amount of of black um, men predominantly incarcerated from that point in time because whilst they were given the right to vote. 
um, very rich people were also given the right to incarcerate them in a much higher and quicker level um, than we've seen in the white population. So, um, yeah, that it's always fraught, I think, in, in terms of that. Um, but anything, this, I think, undoing this constitutional right, I think that, you know, we've heard Senator Elizabeth Warren speak about how this was just horrific. This is actually taking away constitutional rights. Um, that's that's never happened before, um, and and that's really really worrying. And I think if you think about things that um, Clarence Thomas Thomas is, a, is supposed to have tabled immediately after, then brings into question LGBT rights and access to, to reproductive um, contraception. So it's it's a very slippery slope that they've they've now started on, um, and to see really young teenage and in their twenties women, you know tears of joy on their face at this ruling i just think what's happened um you know feminism is all of a sudden uh, you know an unspeakable word in some in, in some quarters in the united states and we saw that you know years ago with the protests a couple of years back where you know women on mass went to protest and unfortunately we've we've seen how you know you can stack a, a supreme court and get what you want um and and this is very very worrying yeah, and there, there was a, a a Trump rally in Illinois recently uh, with uh, for um, the, um, the the Republican candidate. I'm looking for a name here, Mary Mary Mary, Mary Miller, I think Mary Miller. And yeah, apparently the the audience by the end of it, um, well, Trump took credit for the changes that he had made, which led to the, the Supreme Court's ruling, and the. the the crowds were chanting, thank you, Trump, thank you, Trump. And so this is the, they also kind of, and uh, when Mary Miller stood up to um, address him, she still calls him president. You know, she started saying President Trump on behalf of all the, you know, so um, anyway. Yeah, and I think, I think you could trace this probably to a big campaign of disinformation and how worrying that trend is. You know, as much as the, as the social, social media and the internet is a fantastically wonderful tools, you know, Fake, fake news and fake messages spread like wildfire. Um, and, you know, I was hearing some of, some of the comments from, from people who are anti-abortion in the States saying that this is now going to see the States stop exporting that ideology to developing countries around the world because they were supporting um, women in, in developing countries to access that type of health care. And yet these people think that that was, you know, a creeping ideology that we should now stop as opposed to looking at it as, and this is what saves women's lives. Um, so, aye, absolutely abhorrent. Yeah. And, and we all know that it won't stop abortions happening. It'll just make them no. go elsewhere just make them and unsafe. happen in really unsafe circumstances. Um, yeah. But so, I suppose we better move on. Um, but as you say, yeah, the, I'm sorry, the voice in my ear. Yeah, but I think we better move on. Um, well, sorry, forgive me, viewers, forgive me, Ellen. Um, I'm being asked to read out a specific part of um, a press release from the... So the Illinois Republican tells Trump rally that the Roe verdict um, is a victory for white life. Um, <laughs> so uh, she said, and Mary Miller's remarks were greeted with cheers by the crowd, um, but, and a spokesman said that she meant to say um, right to life. Um, and I, I've struggled. I had to read this a few times, Eleanor, because um, first of all, I don't know if we do we believe that she meant to say the right to life instead of white life. Um, and if we do believe that, that it was just a mistake or, or if we don't believe that it was a mistake and, and they're, they're rowing back on it, what, what on earth does she mean? What does skin colour have to do with abortion rights? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a very telling Freudian slip. Um, you know, whether that's what she actually really meant or not, I think is very telling. Um, and I think that there, there ha you know, the African-American women, um, you know, suffer the most horrendous um, health inequalities that you could imagine. Um, and um, whether, you know, if, if they need, 
care and, and abortion care just as, as, as much as everybody else. And I think that that is just, to me, is a, a disgusting um, thing if that's what she actually meant, was this all of a sudden um, protected unborn white children um, from some creeping um, abortion, um, you know, because I think there has been a, a, a polarised view on race and abortion for a long time. And I think that it's just been um, used in such a way across um, the last um, five decades um, to, to strike fear into to people's hearts. And I think if you think about, you know, where you have that fundamental um, Christian belief about the sanctity of life, which then is crept into politics um, in, in America, um, you know, aided and abetted by the likes of Trump, um, you know, I think if, if that's what she meant, um, it's it's disgusting. And regardless, it's it's not a great day for the right to life either, um, because people, you know, women are going to die as a result of this. Women who need abortion care for for reasons of um, their own life um, to protect their life are not going to be given access to that. That's going to result in deaths. And as we've seen abortion clinics already shut down over the weekend in some states, that's already going to happen. That the risk is is there and it's huge. And only women that have access to money are going to be able to travel out of state to get it. Um, and again, that's going to predominantly affect, um, you know, those that are in, in entrenched poverty and then all of the, the different ways that that affects different peoples and the intersectionality of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think Freudian slip or not, it, it's it's not right. Yeah, and, and something that you just said there um, reminded me of... Um, I think I'm quoting one of my colleagues here um, who said it on a previous show um, that the people that seem to um, protest against abortion, there's, they show great concern about human life bef um, that bef uh, before it's born. But once that person is born, they seem to, those, those concerns about that person's welfare seem to disappear. Um, so it's... Absolutely, and, and but there's there's also the the big you know the big issue about fundamentally um, bringing religion into legislation and into policy creation, which should not happen um, at all. I mean, I, I saw I can't remember which um, senator or mayor or whoever it was in the states, but it was a woman, and I watched a clip this morning of her talking about you know it's up to women to to you know to to gatekeep who ejaculates in them now. And I just thought, absolutely, what? I had to watch it several times and it was, you know, a press conference. And I thought that that just puts the onus onto women again. You know, it's our fault. It's women's fault all the time. We're, you know, and somehow um, that narrative um, has really gained traction in the, in the United States. Um, and that that is really concerning. Yeah. And so um, thank you, um, Elena. Uh, the next story... Um, I'll just read this out. It's the First Minister is to announce plans for Indiref in a statement to the Holyrood Parliament on Tuesday. Um, f you, f as someone who's who works in that building and who is a, a direct colleague of the First Minister, can you give us any any snippets, any gossip, um, anything you know, any anything that you've overheard in the corridors um, on this story? What, what I've overheard in the corridors, because I mean, anything above that's beyond my pay grade, right? But what I have heard in the corridors is my colleagues um, are very excited. Um, we are enthused. We've got to the point now where we know that, you know, we had the, the paper that set out um, why we should be independent. Why not Scotland? That clearly demonstrated if you compare Scotland to all of the comparative, you know, countries round about us in, in Europe um, as part of the UK, um, we are poor, um, we are as less fair than these other these other countries, um, and equally we have you know a huge amount of wealth um, that that we're not able to to use. Um, and I think that having that vision set out and hearing for the last couple of weeks at First Minister's questions um, just how how scared the opposition are who who've reverted back to you can't have one because we're not going to let you have one or um, you you didn't really win a democratic right to have one, so there did denying democracy, which is not a tenable place to be. Um, so I think what I'm hearing from colleagues is an enthusiasm that now the, the start gun is, is being fired, that we now have, you know, this route map is going to be set out on Tuesday and I can't wait to hear it because I've not seen any detail at all about it. 
Um, but that's actually going to give us that clear starting point from how we now get out and talk to people on the doors and discuss with the people of Scotland what vision that they want to see for Scotland that could be you know, very different than being shackled to this UK government. Um, that it doesn't matter what stripe that UK government is, it's never worked um, for Scotland. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing a lot of enthusiasm um, and I can't wait till Tuesday. Good. Um, I, we're, we're looking forward to um, hearing what what has to be said as well, obviously, as we report the news. Um, I think it's quite a good um, plan to kind of release these reports. It's almost like drip feeding because it's it, in a way it's kind of going to keep the topic in the news instead of just delivering yeah. one massive white paper as they did before the, the previous referendum. And um, I'm actually a listener. I, I listen to James O'Brien on LBC weekdays, and and for me, he's a bit like a, a canary in the coal mine, because um, he he often covers um, Scottish independence, and has done ever since the, re the referendum, and he has an interest in, in it as a, a topic. His previous shows um, were always very combative. You know, Scots would call in in, in support of independence and he would bat them away you know by saying things like i want it's my country too and i if you get a vote i want to get a vote as well um and now he's kind of come around it, it, he did a show the other week and rather than being combative it was very just very disgusting and very much all oh, right okay is that what you think and that's and uh very matter of fact and now the only thing that he's got to um to against independence is Boris Johnson is temporary, he will go and you might get another Gordon Brown. Um, so I don't know, what do you think about, about that? Well, I mean, okay, we might get another Gordon Brown, but you know, Gordon Brown that left um, absolutely no money in the treasury for, for the incoming government um, to, to try and deal with, you know, Gordon Brown who created the tax credit system um, that ended up putting so many people in poverty due to, to overpayments that I worked with when I, when I worked in welfare rights and with women's aid. Um, I don't know that Gordon Brown um, was, uh, you know, some type of panacea that Scotland should look back on very fondly. Um, and I'm, anxiously awaiting for him to be trotted out again at this time to tell us why um, we should be um, remaining within um, the you, you know the United Kingdom as a Canadian um, that grew up with a, a federalist government um, I think the, the provinces the provincial government still have more control um, in, in terms of, of what they can do than, than the Scottish government does you know we don't have the big macroeconomic levers and provinces can borrow we can't borrow councils here can borrow at a, a, a you know a in a better way than than um, the Scottish government can, and um, so uh, you know I, I think if you look at that LBC presenter as a barometer, um, I think the media has to wake up and people have to understand if you're be against independence if you want to be against it, but give a, an argument for it, but give the the pro independence side a chance to put their arguments forward as opposed to just being so dismissive because in Scotland right now you're being dismissive to at least 50 percent of the population and I think we can't forget that and you know that goes for all um, political parties as well there's people within the Labour Party that support independence I'm absolutely certain that there's people as well few and far between maybe within the Conservative Party that support independence and in the Lib Dems so I think that, you know, this is a chance that we have to make sure we enter into a respectful debate. Um, and yeah, FMQs will get f fiery in the chamber. I think Hollywood's going to see fireworks and the Constitution and independence brought into everything that we do, I think, rightly so, because it should be under that microscope. Um, but I think we have to make sure that we do it in a, a, you know, a respectful way, because people don't like that type of adversarial um, tit for tat. And on the doors, you know, when I, you know, was speaking to people when I was um, before being a member of the SNP and a member of Women for Independence at the time of the the, the referendum, um, women are really turned off by that horrible politics. And it's a lot of the time now it's, you know, women that we need to convince and you don't do that by shouting at each other. Interestingly enough, I think women have started on that journey since 2014. Um, and um, I think polls have clearly shown that as well, which is fantastic. Yes, there have been, you're right, um, really interesting changes about how men and women are, are, are thinking at the moment. And just going back to what you said, um, so if, if you support the union, then why not have a, 
a referendum, you know, and what what are you afraid of? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and there was something else that you said, which has just literally dropped right out of. <laughs> I think you know, if if you put the union on a referendum paper, you know, if we were independent, and I think you know, loads of people have said this over the last wee while. If you put the union on a, on a referendum paper to say an independent Scotland with all of these, you know, um, natural wealth and, and resources of people and wonderful skills that you've got, would you like to join um, the rest of the UK? We would absolutely say no because we would know it wouldn't be in our benefit. There's nothing that is going to be simple about this, you know, and, and unpicking a union of, of such a long time is not going to be an easy matter to do. Yeah, but it's not beyond their wit as, you know, Scots to be able to do that. And we're starting from a much better place. We have, you know, institutions like Social Security Scotland set up now. You know, we, we have our, our thoughts around about a well-being economy, you know, underpinned by community wealth building. Things that are absolutely di diametrically opposite of what's happening in the United Kingdom. Um, and I think that, you know, people in Scotland can see that happening. And we can't be a parliament that just continues to mitigate the worst decisions um, that the UK government makes to the tune of nearly a billion pounds a year. Um, because, you know, we, ha we should have the right to be able to decide um, what kind of country that we want to live in with, with governments that reflect that. And an independent Scotland, that would be the government that the people of Scotland choose. And I think that that's the democratic deficit that we live with. And I think more people are understanding that now. Yeah, when, when I think of the... Um... The, the the UK government in Westminster, the word skip fire tends to, to spring to mind. Um, can I just quickly ask you, we don't have a lot of time, but, but can I just quickly ask you what you think about, I've been hearing rumours that the, the question might be changed. Um, and I quite like the, the, the previous question, you know, yes or no. And and uh, what do you, do you think, I don't know, any, have you, again, I, I, I think, you know, the question itself becomes very political, right? The question itself um, has to be a question that is acceptable to to every party that, that wants to have a say about it. And if I think back to um, the last Quebec referendum, which I, I voted yes in at the time um, for Quebec sovereignty, if you looked at that question, it was like two pages long. It was the most complicated question um, that ever there was. And I think that doesn't help um, you know, democracy. We need to make sure that the question is easy, easily understood um, and is a very simple question. Um, and I think any seeking to change that question is going to have a political motivation behind it. Okay, and, and, that, and that thing about a canary in the coal mine, do you have any sort of people in the Conservative Party or the Lib Dems or um, who you kind of think you have a wee chat with them and you think, ah, the, he or she is a canary in the coal mine? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the, the longer serving um, conservative um, MSPs within the parliament um, have a very different view about independence and, and the, well, the prospect of an independence referendum, let's say, um, than some of the, the newer ones who are, are quite combative about it. And um, so I think there's an acceptance, if you think about things that, you know, Murdo Fraser has said himself, I think there's an acceptance that there's going to be an independence referendum. And whether he agrees with, you know, an, an independent Scotland or not is, you know, is his decision. But at least he actually agrees that there, there's going to be um, a referendum. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so the last story is um, the Pride March in Glasgow. Uh, so I said earlier that I, I'd attended um, both the picket line outside Central Station and then I went from there to, um, I, I joined March, uh, I joined Pride. Now I haven't um, been on a Pride March for years. I stopped going to Pride Marches because it seemed that they were getting very corporate. It was just big names um, handing out leaflets for you to spend money in their shops. And uh, so I stopped and so I was really pleased that this was the first Pride that I'd been to in a long time, where it seemed to get, get as you said earlier, it's, it's got, gotten back to its original political roots. Um, but I was, I thought that the, the strike the, or the um, the picket line and the Pride would be completely separate and different feelings and so, but that wasn't the case as um, as we saw in the earlier video in the fire brigade. Um, have I don't were you, were you at the march yesterday at Pride yesterday or? So I, I... I wasn't at the march, but we were in Glasgow. Um, I took my daughter into Glasgow. She wanted to go and, and buy some books 
um, some manga books um, and my daughter you know identifies as, as LGBT and um, she she would have liked to have went on to to the march but I had to unfortunately well not unfortunately because I loved my day out at the Royal Highland show for constituency reasons and um, but we were in um, the town round about the time that the fire brigade went down with their pride flag um, and you know the, um, the RMT and picket line in front of Central Station so we saw that we were there um, at that time um, and for me that just shows the solidarity you have across struggles for rights so anybody that has you know a struggle for for employment rights for human rights for you know just to realize their rights um as a as people and as um parts of society um i, I think you just see that crossover and to me that was wonderful and i think if you i saw clips um of elaine gallagher you know the the green councillor um who is uh, you know the first trans women councillor that we have um and you know she swore and she was really fired up and political and to me that's what pride should be about um and you know my, my 14 year old um understands that background to pride and where it came from um and for her it, it's a, a very political thing um, and i think it was really good to see it being back to that colorful political rally and cry um to you know for people to realize their rights and i think if we look at um a lot of the 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 issues round about um you know changing the, the laws round about gender recognition um i think it's made it political again because we've seen horrific attacks on people across the lgbt plus community um with this um debate that's that's raging in the background um and uh, you know i can't wait till we settle that you know um issue within the parliament and i think that combined with the cost of living crisis combined with the strengths that we're seeing combined with a global situation i don't think pride could have been anything but as political as it was this time mm. uh, there was, there's another way I'm, I'm worried that um if we go on too long we're not going to have time to play the video um for, of pride but i had a i was also conscious that yesterday yesterday was armed forces day and uh, I didn't see any events. I didn't, and I know there's usually a, a march or a rally on Armed Forces Day, but there's no sign of that. There were young people walking about in uniform, so um, I wondered if maybe I was missing something. So I went over to a family. It was a mum and her daughter and two sons. Two sons were in in uniform, and I asked them if they knew of anything that was going on, or and they said that that um, the, the usual the, the annual um, Armed Forces March had been. Um, uh, Sort of, they, they decided not to do it um, because of pride, you know. And there wasn't any animosity from that family. They were a, a military family, and they were like, "Oh, it's fine." I said, are you, "Are you annoyed at that?" And they said, "No, no, it's fine." It's like we, they'd come from a, a a function in the city chambers, and they were quite happy with that. So I don't know. What do you think about that? The fact that pride is now taking precedence over Armed Forces Day in Glasgow. I mean, I, I think that you know, as maybe a wee bit telling in terms of of um, the you know the, the the discourse that happens in in society at the moment round about um, pride and rights. I think it would have been more interesting and, and beneficial if the armed forces had maybe decided to focus their armed forces day round about um, those of in the LGBT community that are within the armed forces. That's an excellent I think that point. could have actually allowed them to, to you know to participate in a in a, a different way. Um, so maybe they need to think about that next time. That's an excellent point, Eleanor. And um, so just so that we, we might overrun a wee bit, but thank you for um, joining us today. Um, really thank appreciate you. it. And um, so I'll just say um, thank you to everybody watching. Uh, join us next week. And so he, he, um, let's just finish with the Pride video um, that was taken yesterday in Glasgow.